Hey everyone and welcome back. So we now have our plane detection implemented, which means that we're ready to get started with spawning some objects into the world. So by the end of the video, we'll have something that looks like this in the background, where you can tap on a plane that has been detected and place an object. To get started, if we go to our scripts folder and create a new C -sharp script in here, and I'm just gonna call mine spawn object on plane. With that done, we can double click this and open this in the scripting tool of your choice. I'm using Visual Studio Code for this, but of course Visual Studio will be fine as well if you've got something like the community version. Now I'm just going to begin by tidying up the script and remove the things we probably won't need, which are the start and update functions. And we'll need to add two libraries at the top of our script. The first one will be the using unity engine.xr.ar foundation. And the second one is using unity engine.xr.ar subsystems. With those included, I'm also going to stick a require component type of AR Raycast Manager just above the class declaration. And that's because we'll be calling some functions from this class. So we may as well put this on, which means that if you're not familiar with this, when you place this script onto an object in the scene, it will automatically also add the AR Raycast Manager class as well. So with that done, we can start implementing our variables. The first one is we'll store a reference to our Raycast Manager we've just designated. And I'll simply call this one Raycast Manager. We'll also need to keep track of any objects that we have spawned. For this example, we're just going to be working with a single object and we'll improve on this and implement some more complex functionality in future videos. So this will just be a private game object called spawned object. Next, we also need a public variable for the prefab that we'll be placing into the world. So again, this will be of type game object and I'll call this one placeable prefab. And of course, if you wanted to keep the code a little bit tidier, or at least a little bit safer when it comes to variables, we can of course change this to be a private variable and simply put the serialized field above this, the main thing being that we get access to this in the inspector. And I just wanted to cover both approaches because this doesn't really need to be a public variable. Nothing else will be accessing it. The main thing is this is visible. And if you're completely new to all of this, I just wanted you to see that there are a couple of ways of doing this and why you may be seeing it one way or the other. And finally, we will be working with Raycasts. So we want to store a list of Raycast hits for us to use in the update function a little bit later. So we're going to create a static list of AR Raycast hit. I'll name this one S underscore hits. And of course, we need to initialize this to be a new list of AR Raycast hits. Okay, so that is all of our variables implemented. The next thing is we want to create an awake function. And in the awake function, we just want to fill the reference to our Raycast manager. So we're going to do that with a get component of type AR Raycast manager. And again, just to recap, we can be sure that this will always be valid because we have our required component type of AR Raycast manager at the top of the script. If we didn't have that, then of course, this would be a little bit dangerous as we could pass in a null reference. But as long as we have that at the top, we'll be perfectly fine. So next we want to create a custom function. This is going to be of type Boolean. I'm going to call this one try get touch position and it will pass in a parameter of out vector two. Uh, and we'll name this one touch position. And this is simply recording where the user is pressing on the screen. Inside of this new function, we just want to check if the input touch count is more than nothing or zero, meaning that we have received a valid touch on the screen. If it is, then we're going to store the touch position as the input.getTouch zero dot position, so the first touch that is received, and we'll return out of this function with a true parameter to say that we have received a valid touch. If that's not the case, then we're going to set the touch position to equal default and we'll return as false. And then simply to wrap up this class, we're going to re-include the update function. The first thing we want to do is check whether or not we have a valid touch position or if the user is touching. If not, then we're going to return. So of course, this simply means that the user isn't touching the screen at this point. So we can return out of the update function as we don't want anything to be placed. Then alternatively, we're going to do a check. So if this isn't the case, if we've got past this, then we know that the user is touching somewhere on the screen. And what we want to do is raycast into the world and check whether that is hitting a trackable plane inside of the stored memory. And we can do this with our raycast manager that we have a stored reference to by using the dot raycast, the touch position that we have, the hits that we're recording, and then checking the trackable type dot plane within Polygon. To begin, we'll store a temporary variable called hit pose, and this will be the first index in the s hits list dot pose. We then want to check whether or not we have a spawned object already in the world. 
If we don't already have a spawned object in the world, then we want to instantiate, and we'll be using the placeable prefab. We'll be placing it at the hit pose dot position and taking the hit pose dot rotation. Otherwise, that means we have already spawned something, so we already have a reference to our spawned object, so we're gonna use an else statement. We're gonna take our spawned object that we have already placed in the world, and we're just going to update its transform dot position to be the hit pose dot position again. And because at the moment this is still tracking the original hit pose rotation, we can also update the rotation here. So we'll say spawned object dot transform dot rotation equals hit pose dot rotation. Okay, with that done, that is the script ready to go. So we can go back to the Unity editor. We want to go to our AR session origin. And with this selected, we are just going to, first of all, just double check that you don't have any spelling errors in the script. So I'm seeing an error here. As I've mentioned before, I'll always keep these little sections in the video so that we can debug this together uh, so that nothing's done off screen and you know exactly what has happened. So the problem is, is that I forgot to put an E just here on the variable. I had that as hit pause. So I'm just going to fix that, which means hit pose uh, will now be a valid variable and just make sure that we update that anywhere else that I've misspelled that. So again, I'll save that, go back to the editor. These should now go away. That is perfectly fine. Uh, spawned object prefab is never assigned, that's fine as well. Uh, so we can clear that. And now if we get our script and we will place that on the AR session origin, you can also see that the Raycast manager was added just here as well. So the final thing that we need to do before building this and testing it on a device is filling the prefab slot. So we want something that we can spawn into the world. Now I've imported into a models folder, a simple voxel ship and a material. So you don't need to use this, but I just wanted to show something which might trip a few people up. And that is to do with the scale when we turn this into a prefab. So the other thing I'm going to place into the world is the default cube. So I'm gonna to go to 3D objects and cube. And what I wanted to mention is even if you use this default cube as your prefab, that will be perfectly fine for testing. You want to make sure that you update the scale. So in the AR foundation template, the scale of the cube is actually 0 0.05. Uh, so it's very, very small. And the reason I mention this is that if you don't update the scale, in the editor before you turn this into a prefab when you spawn these in the world it's actually going to take up too much screen space and it completely confuses the tracking and the plane detection so what i'm going to do i just use this cube now as a scale reference so i'll always create a cube put this down to 0 0.05 on all axes and then this is my point of reference of the size that an object should be for a prefab that you want to spawn in the world so we can see that this ship is huge so what i'm going to do is i'll just go into scale mode and I'll turn this down until it's roughly the size of the cube again. Uh, we can line this up and we'll just focus in and if we put them in the same place this will be a bit easier. Okay so we've now got a good idea of how big we want this ship to be and we're getting close but again that's still going to be a little bit too big. So I'm just going to scale this down even more and something about that size so maybe about 0.2 uniform there will be fine. Now one thing I would recommend doing is just very quickly taking the default cube and turning that into a prefab and then placing that in the prefab slot without changing the size just so you get an idea of the issue you'll be faced with because again it's going to be something that might trip you up a bit further down the line when you're not following a tutorial. You might not quite understand why it's happening but if you've got that point of reference of where something has gone wrong then it should be easier for you to debug that and solve a little bit later. But with your object ready to go Quite simply, we're going to drag the object you want to be turned into a prefab into the prefabs folder. Uh, I'll change the original prefab there, and then we can remove the interstellar runner and the cube from the scene. I'm going to go to our AR session, and I'm just going to place the new prefab in here. So that now means that when I touch a plane in the application when it's running, this prefab will be the one that is spawned into the world. So I'll just get this loaded onto the device and I'll show you that in action. And then there's a few things I want to return back to the script to uh, just go through in a little bit more detail with you at the end of the video. Okay, so as always, I've done the build and run to the device. Uh, everything's working first time, so I didn't need to fix or change anything there. What we can see here is we have the plane detection happening. Again, that was from the previous video. If you haven't already seen that to get that working, then do go back in the playlist and check that one out. 
and as was hoped, if we press on one of the planes that it's detected, then we are spawning in the prefab that we've designated, and of course it's taking in the correct rotation, and the scale is proportional to the world spaces, which is what we've hoped for. And that was of course from the last steps that we've just taken to make sure that we shrunk that down to match the scale of the cube that we've also reduced in scale. With that done, one thing I wanted to mention is if we go back to our script, this is a question I always see when it comes to augmented reality. Uh, a lot of the templates that are provided by default, whether that be in Unity or Unreal, uh, and especially when I've done AR-based stuff in Unreal as well, this is a question I got quite a lot, uh, is asking how to keep the object in the world because it seems as though you're deleting one and you only ever have one object visible or available at any given time. Now, the reason that's happening is quite simple is this the check that we've done just here, uh, where we're looking to see whether or not we have a spawned object. If we don't have a spawned object, then we are creating one. If we do have a spawned object, then we're simply moving it to the new location. So this is something I'll build on in future videos, but just between videos, if you wanted to play about with things, if you wanted to get a better understanding of why that's happening, like I said, this is something people always seem to ask, uh, is how can I have more than one object? A simple way would just be to create an, an array or a list of tracked objects. And if you have less than, let's say, the maximum number of objects you want in the list, we'll say uh, we've got a list of a maximum count of five. If you don't have five objects stored in there yet, then you can create a new one in a different space when you press. Obviously, increment the spawned object counter and then fill the next slot in that list or array with the newly spawned object. Now, one thing, of course, is on a device like this, uh, working with mobile devices, working with things like AR, where you also have the overhead of the camera running. You don't want to have too many objects in the scene at any given time. You do want to kind of keep a cap on the amount of information, objects, verts, and things like that that you're working with because this can be quite processor heavy. So this is why a lot of the time the templates just come with a, sim a very simple set of logic where you can spawn in one object and that is it. But this is where you want to look if you wanted to change that and improve for your specific process project needs and I just wanted to answer that because like I said I've, I've had that question quite a lot in the past and it seems to be a point of interest for people. Finally just so you know what to expect going forward in this playlist what I'd plan to do in the final part for the plane tracking is to add a simple menu where we can select from different prefabs so we'll create a couple of different prefabs uh, so that we get an option to select which one we want to spawn and like I said I'm also going to uh, creating that kind of list of objects with a maximum count that we can have so that you can see how to have more than one object in the world at any given time and how to recycle those when we get past that maximum count. So that will be the next video and then after that I'm going to start moving on to things like image tracking, object tracking, see how far we can take the AR foundation before it starts becoming a little bit less robust with some of the more interesting topics and then we'll be moving on to view four. So there's still quite a lot of stuff to come inside of the AR playlist. For now though I'll leave that video here. As always if you enjoy the videos or find them useful please do leave a like and share the video around. That is always greatly appreciated and really helps the channel. And of course to be kept up to date with any of the contents coming from any of the playlists on the channel do consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell to ensure that you actually get those updates as ever though thanks for watching and i will see you all next time